Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Lehrer from WNYC. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Wasn't that dance number sweet? I loved how the robot manipulated the human into thinking she was still relevant. <laughs> no, that's not what it was about. Oh, I'm sorry. I was especially impressed that the robot fell on its nose, something it might have learned from me watching when I was out running in Queens last weekend and then splat. I figured I should just explain why it came out with bandages on my nose and that's why. So maybe what it means to be human is that when we get injured in a visible way, we get self-conscious about it while other species don't. My mother says the upside of my injury is that now I can get a nose job and insurance will cover it. <laughs> Which means my mother was self-conscious about my nose even before I got hurt. <laughs> we are very human, we humans. Before we get out, uh, bring out our guests, I thought maybe you all might like to get to know a little bit who's here in the audience with you. How many of you work in any field you would call the sciences? So those are the obsessed people who can't get enough. <laughs> How about humanities or the arts? The well-rounded contingent is here. Business, anyone work in business? I won't tell your colleagues on Monday, I promise. <laughs> and what about crime? Who here works as a criminal? <laughs> Just making sure you were all human enough to lie and not raise your hand if that describes you. For all that Charles Darwin contributed to our modern understanding of the biological world, one puzzling question, which he ultimately posed as an open research question to the scientific community, nagged him until the day he died. How did the incremental process of evolution by natural selection suddenly produce an utterly unprecedented kind of animal such as humans? This program will examine from a variety of perspectives what it means to be human. So now I'm going to introduce the participants. Our first participant is a professor of anthropology at Florida State University. She's done research on primate brains and prehistoric human relatives, including Albert Einstein's brain and the skeletal remains of an 18,000-year-old hobbit-sized human. Welcome, Dean Falk. Thank you. Our, our next participant is a professor of psychology at Harvard University. He is an experimental psychologist, cognitive scientist, linguist, and one of the foremost writers on language, mind, and human nature, Steven Pinker. Also with us tonight is an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Cell Biology at Stony Brook University. He has worked on the human uniqueness problem for over 25 years, and he co-authored the book, Death from a Distance and the Birth of a Humane Universe. Welcome, Paul Bingham. Thank you. And our final participant, a paleoanthropologist, researcher, and explorer, his explorations into human origins on the African continent, Asia, and Micronesia have resulted in many new discoveries, including the most complete early hominid fossils ever discovered. Welcome, Lee Berger. All four of our participants have different theories. We'll see how they intersect and don't. And uh, Dean, I gather you're going to start by taking us back 3.5 million years. Yes, thank you. I'm very glad to be here tonight. I do want to begin 3.5 million years ago and look initially at what archaeologists have found in the fossil record and the, of, uh, that relates to material culture and technology. And if you go to the left there, that little hominin is 3.3 million years old. It's from Ethiopia. And you might recognize the fellow on the right. He died in 1955. And what I'd like you to notice is the material culture in between. 3.3 million years ago, we have the first uh, known stone tools that were deliberately made. And for a long time after that, what you have in the material record are rocks. They get better, they get smaller and more modified. But as you come up to the present, 
uh, you get your wonderful art much more recently, and then today, you know, we have dancing robots. <laughs> so the question is tonight, how did we get from the rocks to the dancing robots? And I think it was to do with brain evolution, and so what I'd like you to notice now is we're going to see brain size coming in across here. So brain size got bigger, and as it got bigger, it became modified and reorganized and rewired. And we know that by comparing brains of humans with non-human primates, we know the size got bigger by looking at fossils. Now, ever since at least Darwin, people have wondered, well, who's responsible and what was responsible for this remarkable evolution? And there have been a number of theories, a few of which are very well known, one is, uh, this is from the 1960s, Man the Hunter. And it's still in textbooks. It's been very, very dominant. But within a decade, there was another uh, alternative proposed by some of my colleagues, who, it will not surprise you, were many of them women. <laughs> women the Gatherer. And there is no doubt that hunting and gathering were extraordinarily important during our evolution because that's how our ancestors made their living up until about 12,000 years ago. So for millions of years, they did this. But I don't think hunting and gathering were the thing that moved along brain evolution. And so tonight, I'm going to propose someone else. Baby the trendsetter. And specifically, I'd like to suggest three trends in chronological order that happen through natural selection on infants, very young infants, even fetuses. And to do that, we have to go back another three and a half million years, even earlier, and look at the origins of walking on two legs, or bipedalism. And so what we have here is a nifty animation of a quadruped becoming bipedal, and the colored part is the pelvis. That becomes modified. It becomes essentially a constricted bowl. And millions of years after this, that will be a problem for giving birth. It's called the obstetric dilemma, but we won't see that problem this far back in time. But let's play this again and look at the feet. So our ancestors, maybe as long ago as seven million years, became upright walkers, and it completely modified the body. And it changed posture and locomotion. That foot ceased to be a grasping instrument and became a weight-bearing instrument. And this is where we get the first trend of the three trends in baby, uh, the trendsetter, which is a trend for being a late bloomer. So to look at these trends, we compare, we look in the fossil record, but then we compare living humans with living chimpanzees. And so you have the direct and the comparative evidence. And we know if you um, see all of the monkeys and the apes, the children or the infants grow up very quickly. They uh, develop all the milestones, can hold up their head, can crawl, eventually stand very quickly. Human infants are slow. They're late bloomers. They're slow developers. And one of the most dramatic things that happened as a result of that is that unlike all of the other higher primates, our infants lost the ability to cling 24-7 to their mothers. The monkeys and apes, those babies are born helpless, but very soon in their life, they can hang on to their infants. And during evolution, there was a reversal. So our babies can't do that. They want to hang on, but they can't. So there was a trend to seek contact comfort. And you see over in the right, you see the infant crying and another one gesturing to be picked up. And these are advanced trends that evolved. Humans cry in a unique way. The babies have emotional tears. And a lot of this, studies have shown, is because they want the contact comfort with their caretakers, with their mothers. And we see evolution today that shows this trend, which we still have, and when you um, give babies pacifiers or blankies, you are satisfying their need for contact comfort, and that they inherited from their ancestors. We also jiggle them and bounce them up and down, and that simulates contact with, being, uh, with the mother being carried along. So again, you can see today out there in the world, evolution. Dean, why do you think the reversal in evolution 
happened? And maybe talk a little okay. bit more about what you mean by reversal sure. and what would have been adaptive um, about that to what kinds of conditions okay. at that time? Okay, I think it happened because with bipedalism, the entire motor system rearranged. And it wasn't just feet, hands are genetically linked and posture. And so babies became health, um, helpless in terms of locomotion, not other things so much. And they lost that ability to cling to the, uh, to the moms. And as a result of that, it opened up I think a vocal channel between mothers and infants, and we have, we see this today too, we have um, mother ease, which is an evolved thing. The other primates don't do it. They might have contact calls, but with human species, you know, all over the world, parents, uh, from when the baby's born, they speak to it in baby talk, and it's incessant. And that is a derived, <laughs> a derived advanced feature, and it's very important for the acquisition of language in the infants. This I, um, leads to the third trend. I call it the brain spurt. And to do this, we were comparing humans with chimpanzees. And you're seeing a graph here of individuals growing up and what happens to brain size. And the chimp, the bottom one, that brain size, you know, it's, uh, levels off pretty soon. With the human, there's a spurt of brain growth in that first year and actually prenatally that lifts that graph higher and higher. So humans end up as adults with brains that are three to four sizes, um, the brains of the chimpanzees. If you look in the fossil record, okay, this is one fossil. It's an infant from about two, two and a half million years ago, and you can see its trend is higher than the chimps. And if we were to put other fossils on there uh, through time, if you went up, for instance, to Homo erectus, which is much more recently, you would see that uh, curve lift higher and higher. So this brain spurt in infants is, was responsible, I think, for the evolution of brain size during hominid evolution. And if we want to know what that was about, we have to ask, well, what's happening to that human brain prenatally and very early on that's not happening to the chimp brain. Beginning in the last trimester, uh, fetuses are tuning in to what they're hearing, and they're specifically interested in and in tuning in to their mother's voices that's being filtered in the womb, and their brains are becoming programmed for being receptive when they're born for language. Once they're born, they, uh, they're busy pattern processing both the uh, sounds mm -hmm. and vision, and it's uh, aimed at or it's directed at language acquisition. Babies, when they're six months old, can hear the distinction in all of the world's languages. They can hear about 800 speech sounds. By the time they're one year, the connections in the brain have both increased and decreased so that they narrow in on about 40 sounds in their native languages. So I think that when we ask about in evolution what was responsible for this, I think language was very important because the kind of processing that goes on, these networks that become widely distributed are also accessible then for other kinds of activities like dancing robots. But you need, I think, um, to have the language first, and then that wiring is available or was available. I do think that uh, it was probably language because that's what's going on during that brain spurt. They're not hunting. They're not gathering. They're not making tools. They're getting language. And that is an either-or theory? You think it's not kind of all of those things? Um, good question. I think. Probably language was primary, and that once that machinery's there, you get all that other stuff. All right. Steven Pinker, do you enter through the cognitive niche? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, the first thing we have to explain about uh, our species is why we are so deeply weird by zoological standards. Uh, now, there's a lot of debate, I think, often uh, rabbinical and pointless over whether humans are unique, whether you know, our language, whether the, the dance of the bees ought to be considered a language, and whether if a crow puts a stick in its mouth, that counts as tool use. Um, and I, I usually stay away from 
debates over definitions or, or Rubicons or dividing lines. But if you just look at the uh, extent to which humans do humanly uh, unusual things and the collection of them that you all find in one species, you see that we're, uh, we're very unusual. To begin with, um, and most salient to me as a psycholinguist, uh, we talk. I mean, here we are, we're going to sit in this room for a couple of hours just listening to each other make noise as we exhale. Uh, there are very, uh, very few species that would do that. Uh, and language has universally a number of, uh, of rather remarkable properties. We can use arbitrary signs to refer to tens of thousands of objects and actions and places in the world, and we can combine them grammatically so that the uh, meaning of the combination can be computed from the meanings of the individual signs and that the way they're, they're arranged. Uh, but I don't think that language is the only thing that differentiates us from other species. I think if you just grafted language onto a, a chimp, it wouldn't have anything particularly interesting to say. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that, that um, language has to be understood in the context of other uh, weird traits of Homo sapiens. Another one is, obvious one, is our reliance on, on uh, artifacts and technology and tools. Um, you look around, everything that we are now seeing was made by an ensemble of humans. There's n n nothing that's uh, in its natural state in this room. And again, universally, humans uh, not only make and use tools, but they make a, a use a variety of them. Each tool is made out of a variety of parts, requires a laborious process of manufacture, and most important, we, we uh, co-evolved with our tools. Uh, if you uh, we, we depend on them for our survival. You take away the technology of uh, any human group and, uh, and it would quickly starve. The third uh, un zoologically unusual trait of humans is that we uh, cooperate with people who aren't related to us, to us. If you were to put several hundred chimpanzees into a room like this, half of them male, uh, then you know, a riot would break out. But, uh, but humans do, uh, in, in addition to the tens of thousands of people that had to cooperate to make all of the things that we see, we sit quietly in order to achieve some, something that benefits all of us. And again, it's very hard to see examples of cooperation for mutual benefit among uh, unrelated organisms. So how, how do we explain would, it? There would are that part, if I could ask, would that yeah. part not be also found in things like bees, to use your example, or bees are, ant, oh, no, ant bees are related. They're, not only are bees related, they're highly related. I mean, because of their unusual genetic system, more related than, uh, um, uh, than, than even siblings. A lot of them are related by uh, sharing three quarters of their genes. Um, so bees would be a, a, a case of cooperation mediated by genetic relatedness. And ants uh, too? Uh, depend, I think it depends on the species, but yeah. Uh, so, um, and there are other unusual features of, of uh, like as Dean mentioned, we um, have long, helpless childhoods, we have long lives, uh, the males um, invest in their offspring, uh, grandparents invest in their offspring, uh, we, have very, we have weird sex lives with lots of sex that's not reproductive and negotiated and varying from one group to another in, in its customs. We eat everything. Uh, we're found in every ecological system uh, on Earth, from, from the Arctic to the tropics. So there's, there's no question that we're uh, a weird species, and we need an explanation. Uh, you know, I don't think, uh, I, there are other weird species, it's not an evolutionary miracle. Elephants are weird in their ways, and whales, and blue-green algae, and so on. So I don't think we need uh, anything exotic, but we do have to explain what led to the co-evolution of a number of unusual traits that are all found in the same species. My favorite idea comes from a, uh, a, a concept uh, originated by John Tooby and Herb DeVore. I'm, I'm hoping if I uh, repeat it enough times, people will, will forget that and think that I came up with it. But uh, I, I will mention that they deserve the credit. And they, they call it the, the cognitive niche. And it, it starts from the observation, the, the commonplace observation, that in evolution, uh, organisms evolve at each other's expense. So with the exception of fruit, every food item for every organism is the body part of some other organism, which would just as soon keep that body part for itself. And so uh, all organisms need defenses against being eaten. Uh, shells, weapons, poisons, stealth, camouflage. In the case of plants, uh, chemical warfare, irritants and poisons and bitter tasting substances, which sets the stage for 
uh, offensive weaponry to defeat the defenses that organisms have against uh, uh, being eaten, more acute perceptual systems, speed, stealth, uh, weapons, in a kind of a co-evolutionary arms race. Now, uh, what's unusual about humans is that we uh, kind of cheat in this arms race by developing ways of defeating the defenses of other organisms, not over evolutionary time, generation by generation, but in real time, in our own lifetimes, by developing mental models of the environment, cause and effect uh, texture of the world around us, and manipulating it to our advantage. We develop uh, traps uh, that rely on laws of physics, on expectations of animal behavior, on uh, our intuitions about biology. We extract poisons from uh, one organism and use them against uh, another. We defeat the defenses of plants by boiling or fermenting or peeling or cooking uh, and, and therefore enjoy uh, plant nutrients. And all of it done faster than other organisms can develop uh, defenses in their turn because we do it in our heads and by exchanging ideas with one another, uh, which is why whenever humans enter a, a habitat, the other species drop like flies. Uh, if, if you look up, talk about definitions of our species, if you look up man in uh, Ambrose Bierce's The Devil's Dictionary, uh, it, the definition um, uh, indicates that our chief occupation is the extermination of other species and each other. Uh, however, we uh, reproduce with such insistent rapidity as to infest the entire habitable Earth and Canada. Uh, so that, I think, kind of cap captures our species. And I think it explains the, why the, that entire complex of zoologically unusual traits is found in the same species, because each one of them multiplies the value of the other. Uh, most obviously, there's technology, which depends on our uh, intuitive understanding of the environment, what breaks, what bends, what uh, falls, what rolls, uh, and that depends on our uh, intuitions of uh, physics, of forces and objects and substances, our intuitions of living things, of uh, uh, organisms that have essences that are responsible for their powers. Uh, I think it... it uh, uh, accounts for our language, that if we have accumulated technological know-how, that gives us something to talk about, something to, uh, to share. And it means that we can profit. We don't have to, as they say, reinvent the wheel, but we can profit from all of the uh, strokes of genius and trial and error and um, uh, accumulated wisdom of other members of our species, but only if we're co cooperating with them. Uh, that is, uh, only if we uh, have something to offer in the expectation of a return uh, farther down the line. Uh, and of course, language uh, is also the medium by which we can uh, negotiate um, uh, reciprocal exchanges. We don't just have to exchange you know, meat for fruit or, or groom one, I groom you, then you groom, groom me. With language, we can say, I'll do you this favor now, but you know, as with the, the, the opening scene of The Godfather, uh, the, uh, uh, there, there, there will be a day, and that day may never come, where I will ask a favor of you, and I expect you to remember what I did uh, for you today, something that you can only do with language. And the thing about language is that it exchanges a, uh, an unusual commodity, information. And that's unlike other trade goods, because it can be uh, multiplied at virtually no cost. If I give you a, uh, uh, a fish, I no longer have the fish. But if I teach you how to fish, then it's not as if I'm now amnesic for the ability to, to fish. We both can have it. I've made a copy of it. And information can exist in any number of copies which makes it a perfect trade good because the theoreticians who try to explain the evolution of, of a reciprocal altruism say that it's powered by the ability to confer a large benefit to someone else at a small cost to oneself, which is what makes the uh, reciprocal exchange mutually benef beneficial. Information has that property. Language is an efficient way of, ex of exchanging information if you're on speaking terms. So all three of them, I think, uh, reinforce uh, the other two. So it sounds like you're describing some of the characteristics of human uniqueness. How much would you say the cognitive niche might come from, baby the trendsetter, 
that Dean was talking about, how much do you overlap in this and how much are they mutually exclusive? Yeah, I, I think there is overlap. I, I, I think I would have less confidence in singling out one part of this complex as the, the, the first domino, but, but I do think they all reinforce each other and certainly our long, you can think of our, why, why does our species have this long helpless childhood? Well, it's a, a, in part, it's an apprenticeship. We depend more than other species on acquired know-how uh, it, before we strike out on our own reproductive career, there's a lot to learn. And so we are helpless for a long period of time just to uh, acquire in our lifetimes the kind of survival skills that uh, other animals are more likely to have pre-programmed. Thank you very much, Steven Pinker. Um, so Paul Bingham, tell me how a molecular biologist doing research into the treatment of cancer got involved in this area, or as you put it to me backstage, what's a nice molecular biologist like you doing in a place <laughs> like this? I actually trained with a generation of people who uh, develop contemporary molecular biology, Matt Messelson, Jim Watson, Francis Crick, and my scientific grandfather was Linus Pauling. And, and from those people, I learned the importance of really good theory, but also the importance of waiting to attack a question until it was within reach. But what happened in the late around 1980s, we began to see where the answer to the human uniqueness question might lie. And that brought us into this domain as natural scientists, bringing the tools of natural sciences into the project. I should emphasize before I begin that there are two other crucial collaborators in this project. One is Professor Joanne Souza at Stony Brook University, a psychologist who's uh, been involved in every aspect of this project for over a decade, and Professor Daijiro Okada, originally at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, now at UPenn, a game theorist and economist who helped us develop the technical game theory that underlies the stories that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. So what we set out to do was to develop what's called a parsimonious theory in the jargon of the natural sciences. That's a theory that's simple on the one hand, and yet predicts a lot in detail. These theories are really useful for two reasons. One is that they're powerful. They let you predict and understand things, ostensibly including human uniqueness and human nature. They're also useful for another reason, because they make lots of predictions and are therefore easily testable. If they're wrong, you can tell quickly, and if they're right, you begin to get an idea uh, that you're correct. The theory that we have developed is referred to now as social coercion theory. And I want to outline it for you in the next few minutes. It appears to be one of these highly parsimonious accounts of some of the things that we've just been hearing about. And of course, it'll be very interesting to hear Dean and Stephen's uh, reactions to this. So before I begin taking you through the details of the theory, let me start right at the beginning by emphasizing that a lot of people are looking for the origins of human uniqueness in the emergence of modern humans, symbolized by the, the image right here, very recently, let's say in the last 50,000 years. On social coercion theory, we believe humanness has much greater time depth than that, 1.6 to 1.8 million years. Uh, at least. And it follows, for example, that Neanderthals and modern humans who coexisted 50,000 years ago were equivalently human by any reasonable uh, measurement. And we argue that our ancestors largely displaced Neanderthals as a result of a particular kind of social accident that we're going to return to in just a couple of minutes. Okay, so to understand social coercion theory, we have to begin at a well-documented and fundamental fact about the world. All non-kin individual animals have conflicts of interest, as symbolized by the fighting individuals here. Humans are unique because we are the first animal to control those conflicts of interest. Moreover, we do this in a simple, specific, universal way through the present instant, as illustrated on this slide. We... <laughs> We take advantage of the capacity of projectile weapons to allow large cooperative coalitions to inexpensively project overwhelming coercive threat against what game theorists call free riders, social parasites, non-cooperators. As a result, in us, for the first time in the history of life on Earth, cooperation between non-kin becomes policeable and therefore a Darwinian adaptation. This, as you'll see in the next couple of minutes, is a revolutionary uh, transition. Of course, guns are a very recent uh, invention. We believe that, it, that practical projectile weapons became available to our ancestors for the first time as the result of the evolution of elite aim throwing. So humans throw with the same kind of virtuosity that a, that a dolphin swims or a cheetah runs. Our minds and bodies have clearly been redesigned for this specific behavior. 
Moreover, there's sound evidence, which perhaps we can discuss later, that elite throwing is at least 1.6 to 1.8 million years old. Now, at first glance, of course, it's a little disturbing that our access to inexpensive social coercive violence is the origin of our uniqueness. But let me argue to you that there is a diametrically opposite and very important perspective to take. In us, the humane cooperation is a Darwinian adaptation because of the parallel Darwinian capacity to coercively suppress inhumane behavior. So, we argue that the evolution of elite throwing is the ultimate cause of all of the other properties of human uniqueness that we've been hearing about tonight. And so let me actually walk you through some of, the, some of those stories. So this slide emphasizes what Dean told us about a moment ago, the dramatic expansion of the brain size in our lineage. To understand this, we have to begin someplace a little unexpected with culturally transmitted information. Culturally transmitted information is very useful if true, but potentially false. So its transmission between non-kin individuals creates a powerful conflict of interest. And an animal can evolve to exchange cultural information between non-kin only if it can manage that conflict of interest. Ancestral hominids had the capacity to coercively ostracize liars and fools. And then that kind of environment, uh, truth-telling and the transmission of cultural information now becomes an adaptive enterprise. As a result of this massively expanded stream of cultural information, we are, of course, obviously the cultural information, uh, the cultural animal, as Stephen mentioned a moment ago. But this creates an adaptive benefit to expanding the expensive neural tissue that stores and processes that all, all that information, giving us brain expansion. Moreover, we expect the brain to be redesigned systematically to deal with all this information in diverse ways, including the evolution of elite linguistic behavior, the quintessential uh, 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 talent for transmitting information. Moreover, we expect us, of course, to be the pedagogical animal, to spend all of the time that we've talked about absorbing this information. We also predict that we should be the economic animal. We have access to enormous amounts of information, but we can't know everything. So, in fact, there's enormous individual adaptive benefit in exchanging the fruits of individually specialized culturally transmitted expertise that we hold with others who hold different expertise. Of course, this creates a conflict of interest problem. The exchange of valuable things creates a conflict of interest problem. And only in an animal that can coercively enforce some form of property law can, the ec then can economic behavior emerge. Our status as the economic animal is gonna be very important in a few minutes as we understand how we got to be so ascendant over the last few thousand years. We'll call that back in just a moment. We also expect that we should be the moral animal in a very specific sense. Our ethical psychology should look like a proximate device to mobilize our participation in conjoint coercive threat. Moral outrage looks very much like that. We should also evolve to engage in cooperative activities that depend on this coercively enforced moral environment, as in fact we do. There's one last prediction that's less obvious but extremely important. We should be, are predicted to be the radically democratic animal. Throughout most of our 1.8 million year evolution as humans, the coercive weapons that were available to us were inherently broadly distributed. Coercive threat was democratically owned. Very recently, just about 5,500 years ago, new technical developments allowed the invention of weapons, body armor and shock weapons in particular, that tended to concentrate coerce, decisive coercive threat in the hands of small, militarized male coalitions, elites. Unfortunately, the social units resulting from that, what archaeologists call archaic states, invented written language. So when we first started investigating this human uniqueness problem a few hundred years ago, the oldest evidence we had indicated that hierarchical patrimony was the natural human condition. That's almost certainly false and misleading. We are, in fact, almost certainly a radically democratic animal by biological nature. That's also very important. We'll call it back in a few minutes. So these uh, uh, specific predictions sort of illuminate the way in which we can understand social co uh, uh, human uniqueness as emerging simply from the evolution of social coercion. But in fact, we, it, they, and they give us insight into the human condition, uh, human nature. But we're more confident than just that, that the theory is likely to be right, because it spins out the first broadly general theory of history 
that we've ever had. And of course, a good theory of history is valuable because it's also a theory of the present and the future, if it's right. So I want... Uh, Could I try to clarify yeah. a few things? Did you say a minute ago that militarization led to speech and language? No. Well, it depends on what you mean by militarization. Democratized coercive threat, ancient, 1.6 to 1.8 million years ago, allowed the emergence of kinship independent social cooperation with all of its features, including the expansion of culturally transmitted information, the evolution of language to transmit that information. And if we are coercive animals, yes. then why would we also be moral or radically democratic Animals. Stephen said before, if this was a room full of chimps, a riot would break out, and then presumably the most dominant and successful ones would, you know, scare away the others for the future, and coercion would have taken place in that species. Right. So there are a lot of different ways to answer that question than arriving at the same place. But so it turns out that in non-human animals who don't have this capacity for conjoint projection of threat. Decisive threat is in the hands of dominant individuals, large and powerful individuals. But because of the effect of numerical advantage in, in the use of projectile weapons, power doesn't lie with uh, large individuals. It, allow, it lies with numerical majorities. It, power exists in numbers. So, in fact, we can only be powerful as humans if we are members of a majority coalition. So we are coercive, but we're coercive of humane behavior in one another, cooperative behavior in one another. Stephen? If I heard you correctly, it was that the first large hierarchical states were the, also the ones that developed written language, not language. Uh, I'm that. sorry. I, yeah. I should have hammered the word written. You're yeah. right. <laughs> but that turns out to be really important, right? Because history is the lie made up by the winner. So <laughs> in, point of fact, the, in point of fact, this written history appeared to present uh, elite patrimony, patriarchy, as the natural condition. And we're arguing that that is most emphatically very unlikely to be true. And if humans learn to control conflict of interest, how do you explain Albany? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Well, Stephen mentioned the importance of arms races, evolutionary <laughs> arms races. So our control of the conflict of interest problem is constantly being subverted by uh, interest groups. And it's a, it's a constant back and forth in our ability to manage that. So, uh, in fact, as I alluded to a moment ago, we also get a, a, a theory of history that emerges from social coercion theory. And let me take the last couple of minutes to outline that for you because it's extraordinarily important, we believe. So human adaptive sophistication is actually no longer really limited by our individual intelligence. It's limited by the scale in which we can engage in economic cooperation, the number of specialists within our cooperative groups. However, the size of our social cooperative groups is absolutely limited, inevitably, by the scale on which we can police the conflict of interest problem. Thus, our human history is predicted to look and does look as follows. Humans acquire the scale of cooperation permitted by the coercive technologies they possess, and then acquire the adaptive sophistication associated with that scale, and then remain at that adaptive sophistication sometimes for very long periods of time. However, for one reason or another, ultimately a new weapon is invented, allowing an expanded scale of policing of social cooperation, and a new adaptive revolution rapidly ensues. And in fact, this happens over and over, has happened over and over again in our history. So I alluded before to the social accident of the uh, uh, triumph of our modern ancestors over Neanderthals. There's good reason to believe that that is the uh, result of modern humans inventing a weapon called the Atlatl or the spear thrower, which substantially expanded their, extended their coercive range, expanded their social cooperation, and then they rolled over uh, uh, Neanderthals for the same reason that European states rolled over Neolithic Native Americans, not because they were genetically superior, but because the scale of their social cooperation was greater. This image is intended to stand in for the agricultural revolutions, another set of adaptive revolutions. There's very good evidence in Eurasia in particular that the invention of the bow gradually spreads across Eurasia and in its wake uh, numerous agricultural revolutions ensue. In the interest of time, let me skip the archaic state, which we already talked about a moment ago, and proceed directly to the modern state that you and I think of as the natural condition. With the invention and refinement of gunpowder weaponry, it became possible to stably consolidate the state initially, and then ultimately to redistribute access to coercive threat democratically. This creates now something fundamentally new in human history, a social unit that practices the ancient human art of democratic cooperation, but does so on the massive new scale of the state. 
we predict and observe an adaptive revolution. So for example, you and I are about 100 times richer than our medieval peasant ancestors of just a couple of hundred years ago. And indeed, the scientific revolution unfolds, uh, the industrial revolution unfolds at this same time. In just the last couple of generations, in living memory, we have for the first time acquired the capacity to project coercive threat on a planetary scale. As a result of this development, we now police in a kind of rough way, in the ancient ancestral human way, a global cooperation. The threat of world war is predictably receding uh, as a result. Thus, we are now irrevocably joined in an enormous coalition of seven billion people and growing. The opportunities for human enrichment at this scale are enormous, as are the dangers. So for example, we now have global financial markets that can empower massive projects but are highly vulnerable to elite manipulation and catastrophic instability. We can also prosecute science on a global scale, represented here by the Hubble telescope, and are therefore peeling the layers off the physical universe at a gallop. The challenge, of course, is to use all of this new information sustainably and adaptively. We are now locked irrevocably in an exponentially accelerating race between our knowledge and our wisdom. I think an opinion that probably we would all share on this stage is that one of the single most important pieces of knowledge we need in order to have the wisdom to build a humane future for all of the world's descendants is to understand our evolutionary origins and its implications for our behavior. All of us on this stage and the communities of which we are members are working assiduously to try to provide that knowledge. Thank Do you, you come up with a percentage chance that humans are doomed to destroy ourselves through our <laughs> wisdom being right. insufficient to our knowledge? Uh, well, as Yogi Berra famously said, predictions are hard, especially about the future. But they, I, 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 I think that we, I, I think, I'm actually relatively optimistic. I think the likelihood that we perish in thermonuclear holocaust, for example, is extremely low. I think it's more like, because in fact we are, we have two million years of experience dealing with coercive weapons. We're good at not overstepping their limits. Uh, it, uh, the, the real danger, of course, is that we inadvertently destabilize global climate uh, and don't realize it until it's too late. Our adaptive power makes us very vulnerable to that end. Thank you. Lee Berger, you've been doing new research, I know, in recent years on human uniqueness. Have your views been changing very much? Well, what was ironic when I was asked to be a participant in this planet of the humans um, was it struck me immediately that, well, unlike Stephen's science, my science of paleoanthropology and the biological or origins of humans is obsessed with definitions and Rubicons. We have spent a great deal of our time defining what it is to be a species and setting points of moment that were extraordinary in the past. What might surprise this audience, although all of us have been speaking sort of glibly, glibly about the obviousness of human uniqueness, is that there is no real biological definition of what it is to be a human. We don't have the uh, fine definition in place that allows us to readily say, that's a human, and in the fossil record, this is not a human. Uh, what happened in the Victorian era, when we first began to examine our sort of origins, was it was very easy. The religious text told us what it was to be a human, and we were separate from the world. We were separate from the animal world. We were different in very obvious ways. We stood upright. We were more complex. We had spirituality. We had tools that no other animal seemed to come near. We had all the physical features that we're all aware of, a large brain, small teeth. We could compare ourselves, and Darwin even noticed this, to what he presumed were our closest living relatives in Africa. But clearly that difference was substantive, it was obvious, and it didn't need defining. It was already manifestly defined in our history. 
Then we began to find fossils. Now, very luckily, they fit our preconceived ideas in the order in which they were found and in our expectations of human uniqueness. The first ones being found in Europe were large brain, but what we would consider crude and primitive in the form of the early Neanderthals. That was followed by uh, faux fossils, which fit our preconceived ideas even better. We even invented them in Piltdown, uh, which actually led us to the obvious conclusion that all the important events in human evolution had happened where the highest states of civilization are, places like Europe. And so we had actually manufactured a fossil record that agreed with our, ourselves. Then we moved that story to Africa, 1924, the discovery of the Tong child. That was a small-brained, uh, it looked like a biped, so it seemed to separate itself out from the world. And the fossils that would follow would, as they began to gain acceptance, show the kind of just so stories that fit the idea of human uniqueness. We would see a slow level of brain increase through time. Eventually we would end up with this large special human brain that went through a series of transitions that were pretty much along the storyline. We found out that bipedalism was deep time and utterly made us unique from all other primates. And even human level bipedalism, when fossils like Lucy came onto the stage, it seemed to cement the idea that there it was, we were erect and the, our hands we could see were prehensile, adapted to tools. And even the archeological record supported that. We could see that as those changes occurred, the idea that brain size increased, the hands altered, that tools appear. So that's why Homo habilis was called handyman in, in the beginning of the first idea of the earliest members of our genus. That would lead to a progression that we would, we would find so clearly to have us ask questions of modernity, the idea of what does it mean to be a modern human? In that very definition, saying that, well, there's something different between those of us today and those things that might have looked like us but clearly aren't us. It's that sort of uniqueness that everyone alludes to. Right now, uh, if you look at textbooks or the archaeological record, it'll tell you that it's accompanied by some things that are happening probably between 100 and 200,000 years ago, closer to 100 than 200,000. And that fits really well with genetic evidence, which is arguing that all of our, we all share very narrow genetic identity appearing just about at that time period. That's tied to things like uh, adornment, the first art that we're now seeing in places like where I work in southern Africa, that uh, appears to be tied to perhaps humans seeing themselves as special in nature. And that might manifest as burial of the dead, etc., leading up to what is a non-definition of humans. That is an obvious. It's obvious when we see one. We just don't know how to put all that together. And as Stephen and I were talking before this discussion, maybe it's just all of those. But the problem with that is that's really moving right back to where we were in the Victorian era. We can see it, but we can't test it. We can't formulate a hypothesis to test it. But we need that hypothesis because that neat little story that I was just telling that we kind of saw through a broad timeline of a few million years as, as, we, as we delivered it, is falling apart. Those sacred cows are dying, particularly in the last 15 years, as what was an incredibly fragmentary, small fossil record. Paleoanthropology is one of the unusual sciences that uh, up until recently we could probably claim that we had more scientists than we had objects to study. <laughs> And that probably tells you more about the people who study this sort of thing than it does about the paucity of, of, of the record. But as the fossil record has exploded, and quite literally, the numbers are doubling on almost a yearly basis now on the continent of Africa as we begin to expand our exploration programs, those sacred cows are dying. Just recently, with Ardipithecus ramidus, we realized that, that bipedalism may have other definitions than this sort of simplified version that we see here of elongated legs and, and the changes in structure to our pelvis and our foot, and that words like facultative bipedalism come into the record. That brain size and, and those moments of shift in brain size maybe either didn't occur at all 
or were not necessarily important for changes. Things like Australopithecus sediba, which my team and I described uh, a few years ago, has a small brain, but reorganization appears to be taking place. Things like the Flores hobbit, that many of you might have heard of, this small, contentious member of the genus Homo on the island of Flores, dating to maybe uh, 50, 90,000 years or something like this, is clearly in our genus with a tiny brain the size of a chimpanzee but capable of complex activity. So that brain size argument may actually fall away or be slaughtered along with others. We're seeing different sorts of, of manipulative abilities that are not all the same in the hands. And we can go right through the body and see each one of these things slaughtered. So all we're really left with are just a few things. In, 19, in the uh, 1950s, Jane Goodall brought us a little closer to the animal kingdom. She found out that chimpanzees use tools, struck everyone as remarkable, and so from that Victorian perspective, it perhaps brought us to here. As all of these sort of sacred cows have died, we've been brought closer and closer, till today, we are possibly only left with the differentiation between us and the animal kingdom with those things that we talk about to identify moder modernity. Art, perhaps, self-adornment, perhaps burial of the dead, indicating we're special in nature. But I have a prediction for you, and everyone here, that's probably a little more than a prediction. I wouldn't hold on to all those things either. Because what we're now seeing, as we begin to actually explore Africa, the old world, other places, is those sacred cows are probably all going to die. And it's going to be a very interesting moment for us as we seek a definition in our field of what is it to be human when there's nothing left that makes us actually unique. But if you're arguing that human uniqueness doesn't exist, you mentioned in your talk a couple of things. Spirituality, the ability to ask, what does it mean to be a modern human and know what that means? Wouldn't those things be unique to human beings? Well, they are right now. They are at least by the, the, the sort of superficial definition that we see, but we don't know where they begin. You've heard, that, you've heard that Paul is talking back, perhaps there are things beginning two million years. Where does language begin? And what would it mean? I would pose to you, what would happen, pose to anyone here, what would happen if we found another species of mm. non-human animal that practiced those things? But it's we haven't. Of, it, it's the Star Trek question, right? It's the idea of how do you meet an alien and what would we do? Because with all these other biological, morphological, archaeological behaviors falling away, have we reached a point where the definition of, well, we can just recognize humans is not enough? So who wants to jump in here? Paul, you look very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I always listen to Lee with, with rapid attention. <laughs> It, there's a famous old saying in science which goes, the question is, what is the question? And that's a much more profound statement than it sounds. And then often we don't, once we frame the question correctly, it leads us to a theory and finally we say, oh yeah, I get it now. So obviously we are of the view that we can define human uniqueness and it all emerges as a consequence of the single trick we have, cooperation independently of kinship. And so a, a counter, I guess the volley back to Lee is, do we see other animals that engage in large-scale cooperation independently of kinship? I believe the answer is no. We can also ask, if we're not unique, why do animals live in our zoos and we don't live in theirs? Right? I mean, I think, I think it's a very there's, there are very specific reasons to believe that uniqueness is not an empty and illusory concept. The challenge is understanding what it might actually be. If I could go back at the barrage of the person using projectile weapons. <laughs> um, it's interesting that uh, Paul's sort of giving a very loose definition of humans. He's carrying it back, uh, let's say rather subjectively, to some levels of creature where we have as yet not found human morphology by pushing those, that humanness back to nearly two million years. You're having to grab into morphologies that are near human, perhaps with the rise of Homo erectus or things like that, but they're not, at least by a present biological definition. That biology exceeds all of modern human variation. So you're having to accept now to exceed even that, 
and yet still call it human. So it's a behavioral definition that doesn't stand the test of a biological definition. Stephen, you said earlier that you try not to get involved in definitions of what makes <laughs> yeah. human beings. Do you find and this I, and conversation... I study words for a living. And I actually work for a dictionary, yeah, so... Do you yeah. find this conversation important and relevant or not so much? For me, not so much for a couple of reasons. One of them is that in general, uh, they generally don't have definitions. They point to things and then your best scientific theory indicates what the boundaries of that class are uh, and that fuzzy borders and uh, perhaps a lack of a clear definition are, are the rule rather than the exception. And I think that's especially true with the products of evolution. Evolution is a gradual process. There's no point in the lineage from the common ancestor between uh, chimps and modern humans where you can say, well, that mom was not a human and that child is a human. We know that it's gradual. And moreover, because evolution isn't a, a, a linear process, uh, but rather one of a, a, a richly uh, branching tree, at any given time, uh, you can have multiple groups that are related to each other uh, to varying degrees. If they get too uh, separated, we might for convenience, put them into different biological taxonomic categories, but then sometimes they can, they can interbreed. There may have been a whole bunch of species coexisting. In fact, we know that, I don't say may have been, we know that there were a bunch of coexisting species. One of them survived, but the other ones were certainly around. And if you get back in a time machine, we'd see lots of creatures, and which ones you want to call humans and which ones not might be partly chauvinism. The ones that are closest to us will call humans. But it seems to me there isn't a sort of a scientific hypothesis or a fact of the matter as to which ones were humans. That's a question of how we want to use the word human. Uh, what's indisputable is that, that uh, we are in the whole space of features of organisms. We're sitting off in a corner without a whole lot of uh, surviving relatives. If you go back in time, there must have been a chain linking us to humans. But now, there, we're just very, very unusual along many dimensions at once. And that's probably as close to a definition as, as we'll get to characterize what those unusual traits are. Dean, where would you like to enter this? Well, I think that if we want to ask what makes us human, that it's interesting to ask what is it people do universally that other animals do not. So we can look at humans today and we can identify some things, one of which is grammatical language, um, the motherese. So I think that uh, we can begin to find things by looking at contemporary people. And then, it's, as Lee said, it is problematic because when you go back in time, you can't, unless we get the time machine, uh, we can't be sure you know, when these things show up, but you can make reasoned inferences. So I'm not as pessimistic about whether or not we can define humans or, or make a step towards it. Another thing is that with the reorganization of the brain, it's true, brain size got bigger and, and it reorganized, and there's variation, like in Hobbit. That's an advanced-looking little tiny brain. Uh, so one has to acknowledge that, that variation, which adds problems to interpreting the fossil record. But something that our species does that we don't see in any other animal is, uh, with our language, you can take a chimp and send it to college, and it'll get a little bit of language, but they don't ask questions. So the human species is a curious one, and it expresses its curiosity by asking questions. So I would throw that into being human. So I think we look for universals to begin to get, get at this complex question. Brian, could I ask, actually, ask the question both of Dean and, and Lee. Uh, so there have been various claims, I think most recently by Fred Spoor and Christopher Dean, that there may be multiple homo species existing contemporaneously, perhaps anchored at 2.3 million or earlier. In other words, suggesting the possibility of an adaptive radiation of Homo. Do you guys believe that, and, and can you comment on that? Do you want that first? Or me? <laughs> well, in recent years, the concept of hominid evolution has become bushier. A part of the problem is that you have a lot of workers out there hunting for hominids, and when they find them, they often name it a new species and say, aha. This is the one that was on the line leading to Homo sapiens, forget those other fossils. 
And you can almost bank on that, bet on that. So the picture is um, complex, and we're just having this week. Within the last week, another example of a new species named, and the question comes down to how, how do you interpret the variation in your fossils? And you can be a lumper or a splitter. So it's not an easy question. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not an explorer who's actually discovered these things, <laughs> Lee will probably have something. Or guiltily named new species. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't referring to you necessarily. <laughs> let, me, let me, though, say something that might surprise everyone. If you think human or our species is hard to define, there's absolutely no definition of a genus. So it's actually irrelevant on what we're calling those fuzzy transitions between two. And the reason there's a problem is we haven't defined what it is to define parameters. I would go back to, it seems to me like some of the suggestions are, well, let's, let's just eliminate everything that isn't a human, and whatever is left is good enough for the definition. But it's not. Because we can't get into these answers to these deep questions. What is driving all these critical behavioral issues? Is it babies? Is it throwing rocks at babies? Is it, <laughs> is it speaking badly about babies that you're throwing rocks at? <laughs> we need to box that off so we can understand, are these driving, or how will we recognize parallelisms, homoplasy? How do we know those have anything to do with the origin of our species? Or we're just not missing the picture from a bad archeological and fossil record. Let me emphasize, though, that it's important not to surrender to a council of too much uh, pessimism. That is, <laughs> the history of science is that things are pretty fuzzy at the beginning, but as you, as you start to make progress, there's a reciprocal dance, reinforcing dance between theory and empirical That's evidence right. that starts to bring things into sharp focus. I think what we, we all agree that that will ultimately yes. happen here. I think the only potential disagreement is how close we are to that moment. We have some questions coming in from all over the world. <laughs> Amruta from Melbourne asks, why did the development of written language cause humans to present the natural order of the species as patriarchal? I think that's for you, Paul. Right, because the guys who wrote that written language were elite males, Roman legionnaires, uh, Aztec warriors. These were individuals who were writing the story they thought was true. That is that they were ordained by God to rule all humans. Does anyone else have a different perspective on that? They were accountants. Okay, go ahead. They were accountants. Oh, there was a lot of bookkeeping with trade, which was at the origin also. Well, that's the origin written of written language, language right. but that's not the question. Why did written language reflect patriarchy? That was could, the question. The I was accountants answering. were males. <laughs> <Yes. Well, laughs> let's not get into whether men are better at math. Um, could, could, could I ask a question, though, within that? There are pictographic languages that are, are written. And these perhaps go back into deep time and are perhaps related to storytelling in some ways. Right. And how do you know men did that? So that's a really profound question. Where the things we, cave drawings, for example, might actually be pictographic language. I was referring to written language as formalized document generation. In that sense, we know that that's fairly recent, 5,500 years or so. But yes, that, that's a profound and interesting question. Okay. Oxine from Toronto asks, what would you have to say about studies on brain size decreasing with domestication and larger brains being linked to aggression? <laughs> Who are you all? <laughs> or maybe I... you, Lee, because you didn't buy the larger brains lead to human uniqueness you and thought the theory, right? You have world's expert on neural <laughs> evolutionary <laughs> anatomy here. <laughs> Brains did peak with Neanderthals in terms of size. So then they subsided a little bit and they've leveled out to where they are now and it's unlikely that they're going to get bigger because of the difficulties to do with childbirth, the obstetric dilemma. So the ongoing evolution, and there will be, I think there is, has to do with the reorganization of the brain. In terms of the aggression in brain size, I'm not quite sure where the questioner is coming from um, males do in primates, including the human primate, on average have a little bit bigger brain. So I don't know if this was a question about whether or not males 
are more aggressive than females, but... Uh, the question was larger brains being linked to, to aggression. aggression. Do you accept the premise? I don't know they are. You don't no, know that not they necessarily, are. No. no. I would just, uh, I mean, I, I'd sort of re-emphasize what was alluded to by both Stephen and Paul and, 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 and Dean, in fact, that, that, you know, it is probably fair to say, fairly dramatically, that we are the most peaceful, at least mammal, that has ever lived in the history of this planet. Um, don't mistake. <laughs> yeah. I'll audience, see you outside afterwards. A question from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the fact is, is that I think it is a mistake to emphasize uh, the sort of application of technology and our ability to slaughter lots of people, perhaps, with our willingness to do so in society's punishment for those behaviors. When we feminize the males, we reduced our canine size. These are all markers, effectively, of, of lowering intraspecific violence, and particularly among males, but across a whole community, and then punishing those that step out of that line, just to, to elaborate a little more clearly on that. I, Stephen said it directly. Not only if you put our closest living relative, 50% of, uh, of chimpanzees in an appropriate size room like this with breeding age males and females who are unrelated, that you would have chaos, you'd have a bloodbath. Right. And that's true of every mammal. Let me emphasize that both Josh Goldstein and Steve Finker have written eloquently about the fact that not only are we the most peaceful of all mammals, arguably maybe a low bar, but that we're in fact, <laughs> but, but in fact we're getting dramatically more peaceful over time. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend both of these remarkable books on that subject. Thanks. Dean? Well now, I watch the news in the evening and read the newspapers in the morning and quite often there are reports of people who, for reasons to do with their beliefs, are suicide uh, bombers, that kind of thing. And so my question is, and it seems fairly prevalent, my question is what happens if some of these weapons that we've created because of our big brains get into the hands of the wrong person? So I'm not as convinced that everything's hunky glory in terms of our being peaceful today. I think it's a serious potential problem. Yeah. I, I'm, not I'm, I'm not sure that, we're the, that uh, at, when we emerged as a species, we were the, the most peaceful. Um, in terms of the numbers that I'm aware of from Richard Rangan and Michael Wilson, rates of um, lethal violence in uh, pre-state people uh, peoples were comparable to those of common chimpanzees, of wolves, of stags. I don't know how many species they surveyed, but just the percentage of males that are killed by other males of the same species are kind of in the same ballpark. But I think that they have been coming down. Uh, and uh, n because some of our evolved capabilities, including uh, those for cooperation and for uh, punishing aggressors, uh, might have outstripped other parts of human nature, namely both the ability and tendency to engage in exploitative violence and the ability and tendency to engage in moralistic violence. And a lot of violence is indeed uh, punitive. Uh, it's morally driven. You don't let wrongdoers get away with what you think of as some infraction, and that licenses vast amounts of violence, which historically, although not biologically, has been uh, in, in decline, or at least so I argue. I'm just thinking the people in the audience may be wondering, are we really more peaceful than horses or dolphins? Those are mammals, oh, dolphins right? Are, uh, dolphins are, are nasty. I mean, they, they engage yeah. in Dolphins and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and, and, and yeah. horses, too, at the right time. Yeah. And there was a beautiful picture of a couple of them fighting there. But uh, again, I, I would say the one qualification is uh, that animals, domestic animals particularly, that humans have had enormous influence in selecting human-like qualities in, might I say, um, may lower some of that, but generally there's only one bull in a field. And one more, uh, Jay Coleman, no location listed, asks, I think Stephen, this is, oh, you're here. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that's why there's no location listed. Uh, asks, at what point does our accumulation of knowledge hit the barrier on an individual's cognitive abilities? Are we there now? Stephen, uh, is that for you, you think? I, I guess. Um, well, not, the, the, it's inherent to our species that knowledge is collectively acquired and transmitted. 
So uh, what an individual can conceive of is uh, not as important as what the collective enterprise of science and scholarship has uh, accumulated, and we're certainly not at any natural limit. I think when it comes to an individual human mind, we are bumping up against truths revealed to us by science that are uh, highly unintuitive. Um, it's difficult to uh, grasp the, the fine points of quantum mechanics of relativity, scales very large, scales very small, perhaps aspects of consciousness and free will, that what our best neuroscience tells us is true is very hard for us to swallow intuitively. So much the worse for our intuitions. Uh, the reason that we have science is that we collectively come up with a picture of reality that might transcend what any of us individually could think up on our own. Let me ask a closing question. Um, I came in tonight wondering if this conversation would just be interesting to you know, people with the human trait of curiosity about what makes us unique if we are unique and where those traits would have come from, or if we can put any of this to practical use for ourselves or society. I think, Paul, you're the only one on the panel who addressed kind of understanding our human nature well enough, hopefully, to avoid destroying ourselves or the planet. Does anybody else have a practical application for this, or is this what you study just because you find it interesting? Oh, no. I, you know, probably everyone in this room has tried to find out who their grandparents were, great-grandparents were, etc. And the reason that you do that is often very interesting to sort of soul search. Why are you interested in that. And one of the reasons is, even without the knowledge of genetics and other things, you know that a part of them lies in you, and that you are the way you are because of the way they were, be it physically and perhaps behaviorally, which might be more interestingly. Um, what we're doing as paleoanthropologists is doing that for the whole species in deep time. We are the most destructive animal on this planet. At the same time, we're the most peaceful. We love to drive things to extinction that aren't our own species, with very little threat of driving our own species, unfortunately, to extinction. And so that's supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we need to understand the origin of these behaviors. We need to understand what drives us. And these sciences, collectively, are the only way to do it. Stephen, anything? Yeah, I, I think the, um, what, what's been emphasized this evening is that we are a problem-solving species, we're a technological species, we're also a, a punitive species, uh, and there are a lot of the world's problems that we can attack with either of these mindsets. We can uh, ask ourselves who's to blame, let's find them and punish them, or uh, from everything from war and peace to uh, economic uh, crises, or we can say, uh, let's set this up as a problem to solve. How can we make the things we don't like less likely without necessarily having to find bad guys and punish them? And uh, I, I think the reduction in violence and the increase in uh, flourishing comes from treating our problems as problems rather than as uh, sins with villains who, who uh, ought to be punished. Dean? Yeah, I think it's great that we have people contemplating these questions and worrying about our future and where we're going to go. And we academics can sit here and, and discuss it. But if uh, I think one thing that I would like to see happen, I don't know if it will, is I'd like to see people, um, politicians and world leaders, become more knowledgeable about these kinds of discussions uh, so that they might apply some of the <laughs> findings. And with that applause line, please thank our panel. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.